quick. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking Dennis for his very kind invitation to speak. He seems to have left. Oh, here he is. <laughs> thank you, Dennis. And also, <laughs> um, I should also say that I'm really pleased to be in Ukraine. I was here a long time ago uh, at the beginning of a trip to Ukraine, and I'm very pleased to be back. So, Dennis, thank you. I'd like to begin, uh, the, well, let me just go on. Um, let me just go. Um, the work I'm editing um, is a four-volume compendium called Critical and Primary Sources in Vernacular Architecture. It consists of 75 chapters representing the mo most important writings of the field. I should point out, I didn't write it, right? I chose pieces that had already been written. My, contrib my writing contribution to this is um, about 2% of the total. So, um, but I did take responsibility for choosing the items and organizing them. The publisher enticed me to take on the project by saying that it would be my chance to define the field of vernacular architecture. I was attracted by this statement because over the years I've developed an approach to the definition of the term vernacular architecture that's intended to demarginalize it and speak to its importance in contemporary practice. I see the vernacular very broadly, rejecting definitions that have to do with handcraft only or buildings made without architects only. So I'd like to begin by saying something about what led me to this view. I studied architecture at Berkeley and was influenced largely by my mentor, Christopher Alexander, who, with whom I shared a background in mathematics and science. I appreciated the logic and insistence on evidence with which he worked, but also was attracted strongly to his vision of a human architecture rather than an architecture of images and obscure ideas and he saw his projects as the vehicle to test ideas not only about architectural form and design, but also about the design and construction process itself. We worked together on a housing project in Mexico that started with the families designing their own houses on the ground and then developing a new building system allowing, them, allowing the families to build the houses themselves. We intended the project as a, as a prototype for a new vernacular in which people would take responsibility for the design and construction of their own houses. Well, let me go back. All our decisions in the development of the human building process were done with this in mind. I'm men mentioning this project because my path to vernacular architecture began with professional work rather than with scholarship in architectural history or anthropology. And once I started to carry out research, it was in the framework of what I called the building culture. The construction of buildings, vernacular or not, happens within a social and economic framework that includes diverse players working in coordination with each other. The system within which they work includes written and unwritten rules and habits, traditions, common understandings about building types, and details, common modes of communication. It is a building culture, and it determines what the physical building will be. It's a system in which architects have their place, but not necessarily the most important one. My interests led to a series of books in which I tried to make connections between buildings and their building culture, and that attempted to break down the boundaries between vernacular buildings and the rest seeing all building within the same framework. Here are just a few simple examples from that research. The first is from 18th century London. This is Christ Church Spitalfields, designed by Nicholas Hawksmoor uh, at the beginning of the uh, 18th century. Its north facade is on a street called Fournier Street that has some of the oldest terraced houses in London still standing as well as the parish house of the church, also designed by Hawksmoor. At the far corner is another religious building that was a church, subsequently a synagogue, 
and now a mosque serving the local Bangladeshi community. But what I'd like to point out is who built the buildings. There was a complex network of connections between the builders. This network paid no attention to which buildings were vernacular and which were not. Hawksmoord himself designed both the church and its parish house. The carpenter Samuel Worrell, who lived in one of the Fournier Street houses, worked on the church, the parish house, and other houses nearby. Other craftsmen who worked on Fournier Street houses also worked on houses away from the street. In many cases, it was the craftsmen and not architects who designed the buildings. These buildings were part of a single building culture that didn't make a distinction between buildings designed by architects and those that were not. The same craftsmen worked on them both. This fuzzy boundary between the vernacular and everything else is present in many situations. The difficulty of the architecture without architects definition of vernacular architecture is that there are many buildings designed by architects or for which architects had a strong hand in determining the design or in which architectural principles were important, but yet that most people would see as vernacular. The designs in pattern books are often based on precedents that are part of the architectural canon. In many cases, there's a combination of academic as well as local influences. These buildings on the Greek island of Santorini have plastered and whitewashed stone walls and because the island is volcanic with few trees, <coughs> vaulted roofs built without wooden beams. But high up on the hill are houses with walls that extend up as parapets, hiding the vaulted roofs. These walls have cornices and ornament, symmetries of windows around the door, often with a small round window above the door as well. These houses were built in the late 19th century for wealthy ship owners who wanted houses similar to those in Europe with clear classical roots. After Greek independence from the Ottomans in the 1820s, Greece looked westward to Europe and incorporated ideas that had derived from academic understandings of architecture and not only local vernacular techniques. These kinds of examples are everywhere. As just another example, some of these Greek revival buildings in the United States were designed by architects and some not. And it's difficult to see where the boundary is between architects and builders as designers. Next, I would like to ask a different question, and that is where physical order in the vernacular built world comes from. This was a major concern of my work with Alexander and enters into my understandings of the formation of vernacular settlements and cities. Here are two examples of how organic order comes about through local rather than top-down decision making. The first is the English doctrine of ancient lights, which was first formulated in the common law in the early 17th century and is still on the books in England, at least in some places. This law adjudicated locally says that it's illegal to block the light to a window that's been in place for a long time. Each case was handled according to its own local conditions rather than through an ordinance that would specify, for example, minimum setbacks or maximum heights. My work included the graphic reconstruction of specific cases by correlating descriptions in legal cases with detailed urban maps at a scale of 1 to 1250. In these cases, the judge looked at each case individually to make a judgment about whether or not a proposed building would block too much light to the window in question. This rule had a large effect on urban form and led to the individual shaping of buildings according to their immediate context. The architect Delissa Joseph <coughs> excuse me, railed against the law, complaining that for decades he was forced to practice in the continuous glare of ancient lights. His own buildings show the impact of the doctrine, changing their height in places where a higher building would have blocked too much light to its neighbors. The fact that the city of London maintained the low scale that it did for so long has sometimes been attributed to this doctrine. 
It was only after the bombings of the Second World War, when large sites and large chunks of money became available for redevelopment, that developers could afford to buy the rights of light from neighbors, and the vertical scale of the area could greatly increase. This idea of local control of regulation was present not only in English common law, but also in settlements and cities around the Mediterranean, where Islamic law was applied to local building decisions in cities in North Africa. Buildings were required to make individual adjustments to their neighbors, resulting in the local variety that is generally characteristic of vernacular environments. The rules were locally applied in a contingent manner. Do not have a window looking into your neighbor's courtyard. Do not put your door directly opposite that of a house across the street. Build a skifa to guarantee that people on the street cannot see into the courtyard. Basically, these rules have to do with good neighborly relations. They were no, there were no overarching numerical rules like setbacks or height limits. This led to the immense variety and small scale adjustment that is characteristic of many vernacular environments. In the culture of building, I took those rules and did a simulation that showed how they might lead to the organic order that is found in these cities. This depended on a particular sequence of decision making in which each step conforms to the, conforms to the rules laid out regarding privacy and access. My last example has to do with the nature of human relationships in, the, in vernacular building cultures, for which I studied historic building contracts in London. The contract is a window into the relationship between the different players in the culture, and in this case is connected to the meaning of architectural type. This building contract from 1510 is for building a house. It contains under 500 words and it has no drawings. It does include the word house, a word that would not be included in a contemporary contract, that would likely use the word the work instead. This terminology was okay because the word house had a shared meaning and accepted enough so that the builder could be trusted. The contract specifies a number of details. The house will have two lofts, one overhang, two stairs, and as many windows as the client wants. It includes the length and width of the house, as well as the fact that the house frame was to be prefabricated in Kingston-upon-Thames and then transported to its, local, to its London site. And that's about it. So if a type is a formal configuration that is shared and commonly understood, in 1510 London, that understanding, embodied simply in the word house, was strong enough that it acted the way that a full set of drawings and specifications would do today. Over time, that shared understanding got weaker as the specialization of individual professions got stronger. The specifications got longer and more specific. The drawings multiplied in number and got more precise. By the end of the 19th century, the amount of paper was enormous. What happened is that the cultural agreement about what a particular building type is gradually dissolved, so the building needed to be represented more and more explicitly with drawings and specifications. The traditional vernacular world depended on these common understandings, <coughs> and as it disappeared, those shared understandings, whoops, sorry, those shared understandings did as well. The changing building contracts provide clear evidence of the transformation of implicitly understood shared knowledge to explicit knowledge over the centuries of the Industrial Revolution. <clears throat> um, wait a minute. I'm going to do this one first. Um, so now I'm going to shift gears a little bit. The most fundamental idea that guides my understanding is that the vernacular is not marginal, but in fact represents most of the two billion buildings in the world. In addition to what's ordinarily seen as the vernacular to some people, a lot of people in this room, it also includes ordinary office buildings, 
and apartment houses designed by architects, mobile homes made in factories, the shack settlements of Africa, the favelas and informal settlements of South America and Asia, the roadside cafes and strip malls of North America. And they include the buildings that are ordinarily thought of as vernacular buildings. These are all commonly understood buildings and the clear products of their cultures, buildings of ordinary people rather than of the elite. I recognize them as the buildings most likely to be built at a particular time and place, and that represents my expanded definition of vernacular architecture. With this definition, the importance of vernacular architecture becomes increasingly evident, and so does the fact of its erroneous marginalization beginning in the 19th century. As architects put themselves forward as educated professionals in whom design and legal responsibility for buildings needed to be vested, other occupations, such as the building crafts, began to be socially marginalized. And as vernacular architecture emerged as a field of study, it was marginalized as well. Nicholas Pevsner's famous statement helped form a conceptual wall between buildings that were worthy of attention and buildings that were not. It affected scholarship as graduate students followed in the footsteps of their mentors. It affected professional education and it ultimately affected practice as the buildings that got noticed by critics were part of the same elite canon and as the design of everyday buildings for most people was relegated to builders or architects who were not seen to be significant. The professional split between architecture and construction helped form the context for the marginalization of vernacular architecture and its study. Before the 19th century, the work of the architect was intimately connected to the building crafts. The architect may have himself started as a craftsman. He understood materials and construction techniques and spent a lot of time on the building site. He had respect for the craftsman, if he was not a craftsman himself, who was in a position to make aesthetic judgments and exert some measure of creative control over his own work. The split between design and building was fully realized in the 19th century with the rise of the general contractor. The general contractor became the link between the building craftsman and the architect, who no longer dealt directly with the craftsman. The craftsmen gradually lost any autonomy they had, and like factory workers, became subservient to their employers, who were now the contractors who themselves were bound to follow the architect's instructions. And those instructions were now in contract documents, drawings and specs that became more and more detailed with less and less room for discretion and interpretation. With the formal organization of professions, the 19th century brought the establishment of laws requiring licensure and university degrees required before licensure could be granted. And this in turn exacerbated what was a growing class divide between professionals and manual workers, white collar and blue collar. This was the social context within which vernacular architecture studies were originally defined and conducted, a structure of professional competencies in which those who designed had control over those who made and built. Okay, I'm gonna go back to a slide that was erroneously put in place. These were the kinds of things that interested me and shaped my interpretations and understandings <coughs> of what researchers in vernacular architecture were doing. When I was doing all of this work, I connected with the Vernacular Architecture Forum, eventually organizing their annual meeting in Oregon and later becoming co-editor of their journal, which Elaine mentioned the other day. When my co-editor and I put our names forward for the co-editorship, we said that we were going to do three things. Expand the scope of writings beyond North America to reflect the cultural connections and migrations of building types in the world include more studies of the 19th and 20th centuries, <clears throat> and continue to deal with the urban vernacular. These things have happened, and they've been healthy for scholarship, even though 
As Elaine also mentioned, there was not universal assent in the organization that this should happen. Um, but I think it has been a healthy development. So it was the combination of my own interests that came partly out of my professional work along with what I was learning about the academic discipline of vernacular architecture that allowed me to develop a particular approach to the field. So now I'm going to go forward again. What I've tried to do then in the four volume work is to recognize these emerging ideas as well as the need to put forward the most important authors and works as they are commonly understood. This is admittedly a very tall order for a work that has only about 75 items in it out of the best bibliography that I know on the subject of vernacular architecture has about 10 or 12,000 items in it. And that's Paul Oliver's um, bibliography at the end of the first edition of his encyclopedia. <coughs> so I'm expecting that when the book is published, there will be all kinds of suggestions about what I should have and should not have included in it. And what I'd like to do now is to end with a brief introduction to the four volumes themselves. Sorry, I've got to do this. Okay. The chronological development of the field provides the structure of the four volumes. Vernacular architecture scholarship has changed greatly over the last century, and the work is organized according to a few themes that roughly correspond to the chronological evolution of this scholarship. The field has evolved from subject matter that was largely rural and with methodologies that were often based on simple geographically based taxonomies to investigations of physical environments that many readers can directly relate to, including contemporary cities with their layered complexity and human diversity. Early writing in the field from the late 19th century through the first half of the 20th happened in a few separate realms. Anthropologists carried out detailed observations of villages and buildings as part of larger cultural investigations in places like South America, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific, places often seen to be exotic. Geographers saw vernacular environments as part of place-based studies and began to develop taxonomies that were correlated with location. Architects were attracted to what they saw as the formal simplicity and beauty of the vernacular and used it as precedence and justification for the clean lines and simple forms of modern buildings. The first volume incorporates various writings from this period showing these disparate approaches. The second volume, which includes writings in several decades around the middle of the 20th century, covers the development of vernacular architecture scholarship into a recognized field of study with the increased use of various methodologies that went beyond those of the older field of architectural history, including those from social and economic history, folklore, materials, and the history of technology, as well as anthropology and ethnography. This volume focuses on the scholarly work from the middle of the century with detailed place-based studies that provided co strong correlations between the physical organization and character of buildings with their social and cultural context. The work was based on detailed on the ground fieldwork, often supplemented by documentary evidence. But although the best work was almost always strongly evidence-based, it continued to be focused on rural environments and domestic and agricultural buildings. And in the US, at least, some scholars still prided themselves on studying older rather than newer buildings. This certainly was the case with a lot of people in the VAF. That this meant buildings of the 17th and 18th centuries rather than later buildings that were more influenced by industrialization and complex cultural hybridizations. Informally, the definition of the field was still centered on individual buildings in rural places that could be at least partly understood in isolation from their complex cultural interactions. This began to change in the final decades of the, of the 20th century, scholarship of which is included in the third volume. 
New scholarship began to include urban buildings, more contemporary buildings, and buildings with complex and overlapping cultural origins. This was accompanied by increased connections to other fields, such as cultural studies, the history of technology and its subfield of building history, colonial studies, gender studies, urban history, economic history, landscape architecture studies, as well as architectural history and criticism. And finally, the final volume continues the development of the field by focusing on cities and buildings in cities and buildings in cities. In about 2007, the number of people living in cities worldwide surpassed for the first time the number of rural dwellers. If it's indeed the case that vernacular buildings should be defined as those that are the most likely to be built at a particular place and time, then the phenomenon of urbanization must be seen as connected to vernacular architecture scholarship. Studies of urban morphology, for example, emerged out of geography and have matured with their own subfields and scholarly organizations, uh, of which I'm going to be attending next week in Belgrade, one of the annual meetings of one of these organizations. These studies tend not to deal with the architecture of buildings themselves, but provide a way to see buildings in their relationships to others and to the larger urban structures of streets and public spaces. In a similar way that the oldest scholarship in the vernacular architecture of rural environments provided the context of landscape, climate, and local materials to help understand the form of buildings, studies of cities do the same thing with urban buildings. I hope that with my selection of chapters for the project that I've succeeded in giving just a little push to the idea that vernacular architecture is not only interesting but important, and that its study may play a role in a more accurate understanding of human life and culture, and also a role in addressing the contemporary challenges regarding human habitation on our planet. Thank you. Thank you.